Hello, my name is Gemma Rowan Deer, and this talk is called Mycorrhizal Metaphors The Buried Life of Language. Like silent, naked monks huddled around an old tree stump, having spun themselves in the night out of thought and nothingness. That's the start of a poem called Mushrooms by Laura Kosiski. It captures something of the unearthly strangeness of fungi. Swelling up overnight, they disrupt the ground of our established conceptual repertoires. Neither plant nor animal, they digest and decompose old frameworks and grow strange new shapes from the mulch. They are emergence itself. Sometimes tasty, sometimes toxic, they inspire our curiosity and our fear. Some are capable of profoundly altering human consciousness and perceptions. And mushrooms are, of course, but the brief fruiting bodies of an organism that is mostly out of sight, underground. The threads of mycelium wending through the soil in vast underground networks that we are only beginning to understand. The edge of understanding can be a dangerous and frightening place as we're learning in the Anthropocene, as the emergent effects of our technologies and civilizations revise what we thought we knew about the planet and our place on it. But the edge of understanding is also an exciting and transformative place where new connections are forged and new ways of being can emerge. And so let's delve underground into the dark and unfamiliar world of mycelial meshworks and mulching matter, Immerse ourselves in the sticky black soil, in the tangle of roots and rhizomes, in amongst the bugs and bacteria. Along the way, I invite you to pay a micrological or mycological attention to my language, to see and hear and feel the metaphors for what they are, to examine the shape and textures of their caps and stems, to attend their spores and scents, and to note the ground they grow from. As we make our way through this tangled overgrowth or undergrowth of metaphor, I want you to reflect upon how other forms of life, plants and fungi and insects and bacteria, how these other forms of life worm their way into our conceptual repertoire, how they take root in our minds, how they spin webs of meaning, how they affect and infect how we understand things, how they can seed or germinate different ways of perceiving the world. And what might we hope to unearth in this dark and tangled place? Well, as my title suggests, I'm going to be digging for the buried life of language. But down underground, we'll first try to notice a thing or two about the buried life of another kind of buried life, the buried life of mycorrhizal networks. We now know that forest ecosystems are extensively connected underground by mycorrhizae, the mutually beneficial partnerships between fungi and plants. The vast majority of land plants, that is around 95%, are engaged in mycorrhizal partnerships and it was such partnerships that initially enabled the algal ancestors of plants to first grow on land during the Silurian period over 400 million years ago. And what is the basis of this ancient and near ubiquitous association? The plants bring photosynthesized carbohydrates to the table, while the fungi share nutrients foraged from the soil. But mycorrhizae are much more than a partnership between two species. Mycorrhizal networks connect many plants together and transfer water, carbon, nutrients, bacteria, infochemicals, and possibly also electrical activity between them. Since the health and success of individual organisms is thus bound to others in the network, including others to whom they are not directly or genetically connected, entire ecosystems start to look like symbiotic entities. When, in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the caterpillar, who just so happens to be sitting on a large mushroom, asks Alice, Who are you? She replies, I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, because I'm not myself, you see. <laughs>
Alice has not yet eaten of the mushroom, but her troubling of individual identity seems to already be a kind of fungal thinking, anticipating the revelations of deeply interdependent mycorrhizal ecologies and the challenges to individualism they engender. The most famous metaphor for the subterranean associations between fungi and plants is the wood wide web, a metaphor that, in comparing mycorrhizal networks to the internet, recognises the far-reaching connectivity of forest ecosystems and the multiplicitous relationships this connectivity enables. But, as mycologist Merlin Sheldrake recognises in his book Entangled Life, the wood wide web metaphor is plant-centric. In this metaphor, the trees and plants are the protagonists who make use of the underground network to share and distribute information and resources, just as humans make use of the internet to organise their lives. But Sheldrake points out that mycorrhizal fungi are not mere conduits or cables, they are living organisms with lives and interests of their own. And so the wood wide web metaphor is insufficient to fully make sense of what goes on under the ground of a forest. Invoking some of the various discoveries about how mycorrhizal networks function, Sheldrake asks, quote, How best to think about shared mycorrhizal networks then? Are we dealing with a superorganism? A metropolis? Nursery schools for trees? Socialism in the soil? deregulated markets of late capitalism with fungi jostling on the trading floor of a forest stock exchange? Or maybe it's fungal feudalism with mycorrhizal overlords presiding over the lives of their plant labourers for their own ultimate benefit. Sheldrake also considers forest ecologist Suzanne Simard's idea of conceiving of mycorrhizal networks in terms of brains – that is, as dynamic, self-organising networks of cells that give rise to complex, adaptive behaviours. There are, that is to say, multiple metaphors for making sense of mycorrhizal networks. The kind of metaphor you choose depends upon your perspective, but it can also transform your perspective, as Paul Ricoeur recognises in The Rule of Metaphor, helping you to notice things that you hadn't seen before, to see things in a new light, or, perhaps, to grasp something strange in the dark. Unlike the hyphal connections of mycelium, the emergent meaning of metaphor allows for two-way transfer, for cross-pollinations or symbioses. So while the images of brains or cities or economies or the internet might help us to make sense of mycorrhizal networks, the metaphors also work the other way too. How might mycorrhizal fungi change how we understand brains or cities or economies or the internet? How might the mindless complexity and emergent properties of mycorrhizal networks help us to understand the emergent effects of other complex adaptive systems in new and interesting ways, so that cities or economies or brains become entangled with fungi in generative conceptual symbioses that become, like lichens, so much more than the sum of their parts? Like a forager who happens upon an unexpected mushroom, when I was first making my way through the tangled mesh of mycelial ecologies, I came across something that I hadn't set out to find. The notion that the strange subterranean connectivity of mycorrhizal networks might be able to disclose something about human language and the ways in which it affects and infects our lives. Human language, like a mycorrhizal network, is a complex adaptive system that is so much more than the sum of its parts. Examining the human brain, or the little inanimate entities we call words, cannot account for what language is or does. We might think of words and thoughts and ideas and metaphors as the visible fruiting bodies, the mushrooms, of a vast and complex subterranean network of associations and connections that occur under the ground of conscious awareness, and that, like mycorrhizal networks, are not just passive conduits for meaning, but rather have a certain life or agency of their own. Language is entangled with human relationships and actions, affecting and determining what we think and say, and determining what we can think and can say, and shaping our relationships with other beings and the world around us. At the same time, the vast body of language is underground, 
out of sight or out of conscious mind. When we think or speak or write in language, each word has its own abyssal and untraceable history and relies on an unfathomably complex web of relations with other words and meanings. Of course, we can dig around a little and look up the definition and origin of a word and find out, for instance, that mycorrhiza comes from the ancient Greek myco, meaning mushroom or fungus, and rhizo, meaning root. Already we have a vast network of threads connecting ancient Greek to modern English through these words, but do these etymologies really give us an origin, a starting point? Do they really unearth the whole story? These words too will have had their own deep history, or rather prehistory, countless utterances that, over millennia, conspired to endow these little vocables with a shape and a sense. Each word carries the evolutionary accumulation of eons within its diminutive confines, arriving in the present, holding more secrets than we can hope to uncover. The sound, shape or sense of a word is always an emergence that belies an incomprehensible underground vastness, stretching away into a past far beyond recall. This refers to what linguist Ferdinand de Saussure called diachrony, the development of language through time. But the synchronic experience of language in the present also relies on unfathomable connections, like spores that are emitted by the thousands to drift on airflows or stick to other beings in order to establish a new territory for fungi, words and ideas drift by the million, hitching a ride on our tweets or tongues, on the pages of novels or newspapers. You can never be sure which spores have established themselves until after the fact, nor can you reliably trace their origin. Indeed, each of the words that I am saying is not really my own, and I couldn't tell you when or where I picked each of them up. If I'm making any sense to you at all, then you have been infected too, and you are probably no more able to trace the origin and emergence of individual words in the semantic ecology of your mind. Just as the study of mycorrhizal networks problematises notions of organism and species individuality, so too does an appreciation of the buried life of language trouble the possibility of claiming a thought, an idea, a choice as one's own. It's as if this network of words we call the English language is, like a mycorrhizal fungi, not just a passive conduit for exchange, but rather a living organism with its own life and agency. Now, for those of you who have been dutifully collecting my metaphors as we go along, placing them in a basket for later inspection, was what I just said a metaphor? Is calling language a living organism just one more metaphor? Or is it another species entirely? Might language be living in a way that is more than metaphorical? To be alive is in fact never to be a totally self-sufficient or enclosed entity. To be alive always relies on some kind of parasitism of the environment, of the field from which the material stuff of a living body is composed and maintained against the force of entropy and decay. Where would you or I be without the supernovae explosions in which the elements that make up our bodies were forged? Where would you or I be without the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, without the microbiota in our guts and in our soils. Language, like all living things, depends upon its host environment, us, to survive and replicate. Language, like all living things, can act upon and affect its host environment in a multitude of ways. And language, like all living things, adapts and evolves via natural selection. Like a mycorrhizal network, Language has its own way of making things happen, often out of sight or at least out of conscious mind. And like a mycorrhizal network, language does not need a mind of its own in order to act like this. We experience this in speaking, in the ways in which words and sentences emerge fully formed from our mouths, often without conscious thought. As an old lady puts it in E.M. Forster's Aspects of the Novel, how can I tell what I think until I see what I say? 
We experience this in writing, when ideas often emerge out of the act of writing itself, appearing as if from elsewhere, as Timothy Clark examines at length in his book The Theory of Inspiration. And we experience this in reading, when words and texts take on a life of their own, new meanings emerging out of new contexts beyond the purview or intention of the author, as when I earlier read Alice's being not herself as a kind of fungal anti-individualism, or when the sounds and shapes of words weave connections through the material surface of a text, as in a poem by Robert Wrigley, in which he describes mushrooms as, quote, dark knuckles rocking up the duff, where, like the mushrooms, the repeated K sounds work to ruck up the surface of the line. Like mushroom hunters, we need to engage a special kind of attention in order to be able to notice the ways in which the life of language emerges through text. Helen MacDonald writes that, when foraging, mushrooms have an uncanny ability to hide from the searching eye. Instead, you have to alter the way you regard the ground around you, concern yourself with the strange phenomenology of leaf litter, and try to give equal attention to all the colours, shapes and angles on the messy forest floor. Or, as Anad Singh remarks, no one can find a mushroom by hurrying through the forest. Inexperienced pickers miss most of the mushrooms by moving too fast, for only careful observation reveals those gentle heaves. Likewise, to discover the buried life of language, you have to go slow, get low, attune yourself to the various levels of textual operation to the micrological shapes and sounds of individual letters or words, to the meshwork of personal and interpersonal associations, to the sediments of common usage, to the etymologies heaving under the surface, invisible to the untrained or hurried eye. For many of us, reading usually happens so effortlessly, so automatically, that we cannot see the words for the text. The strangeness of the experience the way that you and an author are connected across time through little black marks on a page or screen, the way that an author can effortlessly and effectively get inside your head and tell you things, whether you agree with them or not, is often lost in the ubiquity, the banality of reading. The strangeness of the experience, the way that these words and this grammar come through me, but certainly not from me, is often obscured behind the illusion that I have, that we all have, of being a conscious agent, an author of words and actions. Anna Singh writes that human exceptionalism blinds us. Science has inherited stories about human mastery from the great monotheistic religions. These stories fuel assumptions about human autonomy and they direct questions to the human control of nature rather than to species interdependence. One thing often taken for evidence of human exceptionalism and mastery is language. As such, we can be blind to its power and its agency. We are so immersed in it that we regularly fail to apprehend it at all, but when we do, it is often assumed to be just one more thing that is under our control, a tool to be manipulated. Yet this is not true. Language is before and beyond us, affecting, infecting and inflecting our lives in incalculable ways. Going under the ground of the forest entirely changes the way that we understand what goes on above ground. It transforms and disperses our sense of agency and interconnection and decomposes our privileging of the visible. To compare the workings of language to mycorrhizal networks is like all metaphors, necessarily incomplete. It fails to fully account for the complexities of either system. But what I mean to do by making this comparison is to invite us to become a little more aware of the underground life of language and the way that it affects our lives. It might help us to see how far we are all entangled in a vast and ancient semantic ecosystem and to begin to notice how far we rely on this symbiotic exchange in order to think and act at all. So next time that you happen upon some words in your mind or mouth, take a moment to reflect on the strangeness of their emergence, having spun themselves in the night out of thought and 
nothingness 